we say good day, good afternoon to each of you. Welcome to worship. Would you join us as we, as we pray? Eternal God, our Father, we're grateful unto you for the splendor of your name, the power of who you are. Uh, Father, we uh, belong to you. We're grateful that that's a truth that rings true no matter uh, what situation we may find ourselves in, that we belong to you. The good news is that you come and see about those that belong to you. So, Father, we pray that we would be encouraged, we would be strengthened, uh, knowing that it's not by our strength, it's not by our might, but it's by the hand of our God, that we can come out of whatever we are in and that we can face whatever is seeking to cause us to lose faith in you. So, Father, use us now to glorify your name. This we pray in your son Jesus' name. And we say amen. Amen. See our praise team. Amen, amen, amen. Somebody needs to know that God's got a blessing with your name on it. We just stopped by to encourage you. No matter what you're going through, God still has good thoughts towards you. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a hope and a future. Woo! It makes no difference what you're going through. You're gonna make it, God's gonna see you through. Hold your head up, put a smile on your face.
blessing. God's got a 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 blessing. With your name. thankful unto God that he withholds no good thing from those who belong to him. Amen. Would you bow with us as we pray? Father, we thank you again for your many and varied blessings that meet us at moments in our life that we need them most. Father, we pray that in these last and evil days, God, you would help us to be mindful of you, faithful in what you've called us to do trusting in you, oh God. Help us not to give in to fear, worry, or doubt, but continue trusting and believing that the one who called us is faithful to keep his word. Lord, we pray that as we proclaim the truth of your word, that you would guide us, that the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart, that they would be acceptable in your sight. Oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer, less of me and more of you, it's in Jesus' name we pray, and every heart said amen. 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 Good to be with you all uh, on this another occasion to honor God, give thanks unto God, and just to talk about uh, His grace, His goodness, His mercy, His faithfulness, uh, His long-suffering, uh, and His loving, loving kindness. Uh, we pray that each of you uh, had a wonderful uh, holiday weekend as we uh, remember uh, those uh, men and women that served uh, in the armed forces and the military and uh, paved the ultimate uh, sacrifice. Uh, in, uh, we are certainly indebted unto them uh, for the freedoms uh, that we get to participate and get to enjoy now. On today, we continue in the book of 1 Peter, uh, 1 Peter uh, chapter 5, uh, beginning at verse 6. And again, Peter's writing to believers to encourage believers, to strengthen believers. Uh, so don't find it strange that sometimes you are around believers that need encouraging. Amen. It doesn't mean that there is something wrong with the believer because they need encouragement. It's not a sign of a lack of faith, but everybody needs encouragement every now and then. Amen. Amen. If you don't need in, encouraging you, that means you're not working. Amen. When, when you're working, you are bound to get tired. Amen. Amen. And so we uh, encourage uh, each of you to, man, uh, look for opportunities to be encouraging uh, to, to somebody else and not, you know, just considering our own self, looking at our own problems, our own struggles. Uh, we're in this together. Amen. And, and, and the we uh, I'm mentioning is the church, right? And so that's the, the, the universal church. And so we have to um, continue to hold up the bloodstained banner of Jesus Christ. And uh, if you were listening uh, this past Sunday, you know that the Lord is going to take care of those who belong to him. As we continue uh, listening to what Peter would say to the believers then, I think it's encouraging uh, for, us to, for us now and instructive uh, for us now, uh, but as we consider uh, how we relate uh, one to another, not, not uh, simply outside of the church, but even uh, within the church, uh, how, we, how we carry ourselves, how we comport ourselves, how we allow fellowship uh, to grow, a koinonia, uh, where there is a, 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 a loving kind of relating of one to another. And uh, in this way, uh, we represent or represent Christ. Uh, to a watching world. 
And so in this fifth chapter of 1 Peter, Peter begins talking to the elders or to those who are leading. And he gives them instructions on how they need to lead. And then he mentions to those that are being led how they should carry themselves. And then he mentions to all of them, hey, listen, all of you, uh, in verse 5, um, clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Verse 6 says, therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. Since verse 5 is true, then verse 6 is the correct exhortation. He says, God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. If you want to have God as an opponent, be proud. Be prideful in yourself. Uh, think that you are God. Think, think more highly of yourself than you should. And the Bible says that you will have an opponent. And his name would be God. And he is undefeated. <laughs> You, you will not rewrite history. You will, you will not be the first to be victorious. Um, but you will uh, cause yourself harm, cause yourself trouble. Uh, but the truth is, the truth is God, God is so good uh, that whatever he does, it is for our good. Uh, we, we've said before that every act of judgment before the final judgment is an act of grace. It's an act of mercy. It's an opportunity for us to say, hey, listen, I'm not God, and there is one, so I need to submit to the one that is God. So Peter says, because if you don't humble yourself, God will do it for you, and if you humble yourself, God will exalt you. Since that's true, then you humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Because God is all powerful. He, 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 can do, he can do whatever it is he wants to do. There, there's nobody that can overrule him or super rule him. And so none of us uh, should be so, um, so high on ourselves that we think that we are above God or above anyone else because we stand in need of the same grace and the same mercies as our neighbors. He says, Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time. And then, and then verse 7 follows this. It's casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Um, many times uh, the source of our anxiety uh, is us trying to handle our problems in our own strength. Amen. Us trying to tackle uh, our assignment in our own strength. Trying to work out our own calling in our own strength. And that in itself is a sign of pride. It's a sign of being proud, that we're not trusting God to do it. I'm going to just stay up all night and read and study, and, I, and I'm going to just trust myself. No, study is good, but we have to trust and rely on the Lord to do what he's already called us to do and to rely on the Holy Spirit. If believers could honor God, could satisfy God, could live for God, Without the Holy Spirit, then there will be no need for the Holy Spirit. But Jesus, his instructions uh, for those first early disciples was to go and wait for the Holy Spirit. Because when the Holy Spirit comes, you will have power. It's not that they didn't have any power before the Holy Spirit comes, right? Because they've, they've witnessed before. They've, they've done miracles before. But he says, no, no. For what y'all about to do, for, for this mission, for this next leg of the journey, you're going to need something that you don't yet have. You're going to need the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You're going to need the, the presence of the Holy Spirit active in your life, uh, not just from moment from moment, but every moment. And so since that is true, believers are no longer tarrying for the Holy Ghost. We don't have to wait for a specific day or a certain day uh, for the Holy Spirit to come. If you are saved, the Holy Spirit has come in your life. Amen. If the Holy Spirit has not come in your life, then that means you are not saved. Amen. Because the Holy Spirit uh, is a seal, right? The, the Holy Spirit identifies that the believer belongs to God. 
Without the seal, you don't belong to God. The proof that you have the Holy Spirit is not that you speak in tongues. Amen. It is, it is not, that is not the proof. Amen. And really the truth is, it's not for us to try to evaluate who has it. Amen. It is our, our job, right, to be ambassadors for the Lord, to represent him uh, to others, to a watching world. And if there are those who we think may not be saved, then it is our job to witness to them, to share with them the love of Christ so that they too can be saved. One, because we love them. Two, because we believe the truth of the Bible, that the, that the Lord is summing up things, that time is winding down, and it's not going to start over again. <laughs> Amen. And we say that it's going to be good only for a specific set of people. And those are those who have placed themselves in Christ, those who have placed faith in Jesus. For those that are unsaved when the Lord returns, it's going to be unto judgment or unto damnation, unto condemnation. It's not going to be good for them. And if we believe that, then we ought to share with those so that they will miss it. Amen. Peter says to them, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Uh, anybody enduring suffering um, needs to know that there is somebody that you can cast your cares to. That in the midst of your suffering, there is somebody that cares. You, you're not in this by yourself. Uh, the old church should say, you have a friend in Jesus. Man, because sometimes the truth, truth be told, sometimes we, we, we really do just need a friend. We really do just need somebody to talk to that we don't feel like it's judging us in the moment. Sometimes we just need for somebody just to, just to sit with us. I, t- I, t- I say miss my wife often. I, I miss my uh, maternal, uh, my paternal uh, grandmother, my, my father's mother, because we could talk without talking. You know, I could just go and just stand in the doorway and not say a thing. And watch her as she's watching the, the Price is Right or Wheel of Fortune because it's just good just to, just to have somebody that cares. Man, Jesus is that kind of friend. He sticks closer, he sticks closer than a brother. Man, I, 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 I pray that everybody would experience Christ in that kind of way. That no matter how bad it is or how bad it looks, how bleak it looks, you still have a friend in Jesus. There are too many people giving, uh, giving up, waving the white flag, throwing in the towel, when the truth is there, there's somebody that cares. And when you think you can't go any further, there is one who will carry you. His name is Jesus. You, you don't have to walk alone. Man, that, that was encouraging uh, to me. Uh, when I was, you know, unsaved, and, 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 and many times the preacher would remark, if you want to go down and be saved, you don't have to walk by yourself. Somebody will walk with you. The truth is that even after you saved, somebody is going to walk with you. We were not meant to do life by ourselves. Amen. We were not to be meant to be solitary beings. We need one another. Amen. That's the way the Lord wanted it to be. So he says, in in, in the midst of your suffering, you can cast your your cares on me, your anxieties on me, your frustrations on me, because, because God, he cares for you. And then he says, in in the midst of this, you can be of sober spirit, and you need to be alert. Why, preacher? Because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, lion seeking someone to devour. You need to be sober, and you need to be on alert, because you have a real adversary. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Be of sober spirit. Many times we think alcohol 
or drugs is, are the only things that can have us intoxicated, but there are other things that can have us intoxicated. Pride can have us intoxicated. Thinking that we're better off than we are can have us intoxicated. Uh, there, there are other things uh, around us that the world is throwing at us that will seek to have us not as sober and as watchful as we are. Sometimes our comfort can have us not be sober, can have us not be alert. Sometimes, sometimes we can just be too comfortable. Hmm. And the Lord just shakes shake some stuff up. Yeah. Maybe, maybe that's, what he, that's what he's doing now. He, <laughs> y'all too comfortable. Y'all, y'all too familiar with me. And not in a good sense, but in the sense that you kind of take me for granted. And, and, and from, from the Old Testament unto, unto now and even into the future, God has, already, has always called those who worship him um, to be, um, not to worship a plurality of gods, but to worship one God. Not to worship God and other things, but to only worship one God. And it's amazing. Uh, then I was going to say the last few years, but in the last several years, there are people who have been trying to worship multiple gods, right? Like, I, I love Jesus. I believe by faith. But then add other secular views or uh, Egyptian gods to Jesus or put them on the same level and worship. No, God is, God is not pleased with that. The Bible says he, he is a jealous God, and he says that you shall not have no other God before me. God is the only one who can say that before me, no God was formed. And then he says, no, after me shall there be one. God must really be God to make that kind of statement, to make that kind of claim. And so believers have to be careful that being open-minded or trying to, try to fit in on jobs or in whatever kind of organization we're a part of, that we don't begin to worship multiple gods. That's what got Israel in trouble, right? Before they got into the land, they knew that they were supposed to only worship one God. And he says, when y'all get into this land of promise, don't y'all begin worshiping all these other gods. Because if you do, you're going to find yourself in trouble. You know what they did? Say, yes, sir, God. We're going to follow you. And got to observing folk worshiping other gods. You know, they, they doing all right. And here we are doing some of the similar things. We've made it to whatever level of success we have because the one God brought us this far by faith. And now we're at whatever level we're at, and now we're trying to add to this God. No, there's, there's simply one God. And so he says, no, y'all be sober and be on alert why? Because there's a real enemy. He doesn't understand time out. He doesn't understand you just buried a relative. I mean, like, he, 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 he has no, no good manners. It says he is prowling around seeking someone to devour. You, you have a real enemy, and they're not flesh and blood. It is the devil, like the real devil. He is an adversary. He is looking for someone to pull down. It was interesting. I was talking to, talking to a, uh, uh, one of our members, and um, they were talking about being out in their garden, and um, they said that they have snakes in the backyard, so they have to be careful about snakes. And so we kind of talked about different remedies for snakes, and they mentioned uh, by somebody told them to put some sulfur down, and they put some sulfur down um, around the front as well, and they could see a snake slithering up against uh, the edge line of the yard, and everywhere the sulfur was, it did not try to go in. It kept slithering until it found another opening. 
Man, Satan is just that way. He's seeking who he can devour. He, he's seeking how can he gain access. So we have to be alert. We have to be, have to be sober. Don't be, don't be telling people it don't take all that. Yes, it do. Still, still trust and obey. Amen. You can't depend on your history as a tither. Well, you know, back 40 years ago, I used to tithe. <laughs> you quit. <laughs> No, keep, keep trusting, keep, keep obeying, because your, your enemy, he hadn't stopped prowling. He's still seeking. And, and, and it's interesting because Peter is the one writing, and Peter is a good candidate to write this because Jesus told him the same thing. He said, Peter, the devil see, is seeking to sift you like wheat. But then he says, but I prayed for you. And when you are converted, go back and encourage the brethren, which suggests that Peter is about to give in. Peter is about to fall, but it's not going to be fatal. Because the Lord says, I've prayed for you, Peter. And he doesn't say if you are converted. He says when you are converted, go and strengthen the brethren. The truth is, for every believer, we may have a Peter moment. We may have already had a Peter moment. But the truth is, Christ not only has has he prayed for Peter, he has prayed for us too. And he says, when you have your Peter moment, when you have your, your failing moment, when you are converted, when you are strengthened in your faith, go and strengthen another brother. Go and strengthen another sister. Don't be watching for folk to fall and say, mm, I told you it wasn't until they fail. No, go strengthen somebody. There's one adversary. There's one accuser. Well, that's a sermon in itself. The Lord has not called any believer to be the accuser. They say, I told you it wasn't on today. That's not a believer's role. That's Satan's role. That's what what the devil is doing. He said, look, God, I told you it wasn't on today, faith. He's called believers to strengthen the brethren. Verse 9, after he tells them, that there is an adversary actively seeking to devour them, he says to them, but resist him. He likened this, this adversary to a lion. How you resist a lion? Like a lion weighs, like, like it's an unfair advantage. But he says, but resist him. Firm in your faith which suggests that our adversary can be resisted. And he says the way to resist this adversary is to be firm in your faith. And then he says, so that you don't think what you are experiencing is isolated to you, so you won't uh, have your pity party too long. He says, hey, listen, know that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. Not in the world as sinners, but other brothers or other believers who are in the world, who are presently alive. He says they are experiencing suffering too. And so you ought to know that you're not in this by yourself, but stand firm in your faith. And as you stand firm, you will resist the devil. You will resist being devoured, because if you resist him, he won't devour you. If you stand firm in your faith, it won't devour you. Don't allow the suffering uh, or, or the tragedies you encounter cause you to jettison your faith. No, it's, it's in suffering that you really need your faith. In fact, without suffering, you don't even know how much faith you really have. Yeah. Yeah, you want to know if God really is good, go through something. Get sick. Have somebody to die. Uh, Be let down. You will discover that God is the keeper. In fact, it's it's in the midst of suffering that, that, that we come to know God more intimately. And so Peter says, 
in your suffering, resist the devil. In your suffering, resist giving in, but stand firm in your faith. You can stand firm in your faith because of what Peter has already said. Verse 7, he says, cast cast your anxiety on him because he cares for you. That's why you can stand firm in your faith. And then verse 10 uh, begins to, to, to continue to bring the message home. It says, after you have suffered for a little while. Now, we have to remember that God's timing is not our timing. Right? Like when, when God says a little while, it may not be the same as our little while. <laughs> right? <laughs> Those of us who, who have been around children, like we, we even have different times than them, right? Because what is a little while to adults is not necessarily a little while to children. Right? You're on the road trip, and you told them how long it's going to be. You've been driving five minutes. Are we there yet? No, it's a six-hour drive. Okay. They ask you again five minutes later. Are we there? No, it's a six-hour. We've just been riding ten minutes. Right? And so sometimes <laughs> what's a little while to God Feels like an eternity to us. But Peter says, after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself, not going to send a proxy, not, not going to send a, a, a stand-in, but he himself is going to perfect you, going to confirm you, strengthen, and he's going to establish you. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that you'll see this happen on this side, right? There there will quite possibly be moments that God does this for the believer on this side. But ultimately, this happens on the other side. This is why our faith is future. Our our hope is future. And Peter, Peter reminds the believer that no matter what we're going through, no matter how bad or difficult the suffering, there is one that's going to make everything all right. His name is Jesus. In fact, he reminds us again in verse 10 that we've been called. And then he says, who who called you to his eternal glory in Christ. What you are experiencing now may not look glorious. What you are experiencing now, especially if you're suffering, does not feel good. In fact, it doesn't even feel like it's working for your good. But when you consider that the Lord says this is a little while, it must mean that what he has in store for us is so good that it's going to cause us to forget about this little bit of suffering we've gone through. Say, preacher, you don't know my story. Whatever your story is, God says it's a little while. Matter of fact, Paul would call whatever you've been through a light affliction in comparison to being with the Lord eternally. No matter how difficult it is, how heavy the weight, it is as nothing when we consider how Christ has saved us and what it's going to be like when he comes to redeem us. Yeah, no, no. He says, after you've suffered for a little while, the, the God of all grace who called you, um, not, not the gods of the folk around you, but, but the, the God, um, not, not, not some plurality of gods, but the God, um, the one who is gracious. He himself is going to perfect you, mature you, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. And then Peter begins to conclude, he says, to this God, to him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. He talks about it. It's, it's, they have a real adversary who's moving about like a roaring lion, seeking to devour them. But then he points them to one who is greater. Many times the tendency is for us to think that what we are facing is greater than the one who is holding us. Sometimes that's why we worry. That's why we're anxious, right? Because we feel outnumbered. We feel overwhelmed. And Peter here is saying to us that sometimes that's that's a sign of pride. 
because you, you're trying to handle it. You're trying to trust yourself. And Peter is saying, if you're trying to trust yourself, your God isn't big enough. You, you're going to always be underprepared. You, you, you're going to always be overwhelmed because you, you, your God's not big enough. God didn't create us to be God. He created us to worship and to give praise to the God. And he, he, he is so good, and what he has in store for the believer is so good that after a little while, it's going to all be over. Hmm. And then he begins to thank, uh, thank, thank those who work with him. Verse 12 says, through Silvanus, our faithful brother, for so I regard him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Then he says this, stand firm in it. I told you how he was talking to believers. Tell them to stand firm in it. And this is kind of a repetition, right? Like he, he's kind of repeating some things so that these believers will not give in, so that they won't give up because the devil really can't make them do anything. He can't make them lose their relationship. He, he, he can't sever them from God, but he can tempt them. He can, he can try them. He can, he can have them thinking that what he has to offer is better or that God is not able. But he's trying to help believers to stand firm in the grace of God. If believers needed to hear it then, believers today still need to hear that. To stand firm. Stand firm. And really, this is, this is what needs to be preached more even at funerals. We've made funerals all about the deceased person. We've made the whole funeral a eulogy. Where, where is the hope of glory in simply just celebrating the person? That has a place, but man, at the funeral, you have people present who may not normally be present in church. And so they want to know what it is about this Christian hope that keeps us steadfast and always abounding in the work of God. And at the funeral is the, one of the best times where the Lord has their attention. And we just want to make them laugh, make them comfortable. Peter says to these, to these believers, y'all better be sober because there is a real adversary. And time is winding down. Somebody needs to hear that at the home going celebration. That while we're celebrating, we need to talk about why we're able to celebrate. Or even why, why, why do we call it a celebration? Everybody crying, why, why we call this a celebration? This, this don't feel like a birthday party. This don't feel like New Year's Eve. Why, why do we call this a celebration? You need to talk about that. Church family, hear, hear me. Let, let us rethink funerals, home-going celebrations. Yes, let's talk about the, our deceased brother or sister in Christ, but let's make a bigger fuss of, of the hope that's in Christ Jesus. Let's not rob those who can hear of why they ought to trust in Jesus while they're sober. Now, we know some of them really won't be sober, um, but death is an opportunity for those to really consider, for people to really consider their own mortality. Amen. And so let's, let's, let's reconsider what that homegoing celebration really looks like. Because folk need to hear that time is winding, time is winding down. And if we believe that, then we ought to share with people, man, hey, listen, if you're not in, if you're not in Jesus, um, when they sing the song, Some Glad Morning, when this life is over, I'll fly away to, a, to the celestial shore, that's, that's only for believers. 
right? That, that song, all of us can sing it, but it's only true of believers. We need to have some disclaimers at the funeral. We need to have some disclaimers as we sing it. You can sing it, but for it to be true, you have to be in Jesus. Because the Bible tells us all of our, all of our blessings are in Christ. And so to, to, to grab hold of them, then we too need to be in Christ. To be out of Christ means to be, man, in a bad way. And people out of Christ need to understand where they are. Not trying to scare people, but trying to just give them the God on his truth. Where they can make a, a good decision. Let's see how people pros and cons. Our God is big enough and bad enough for us to talk about, to share our Christian hope. And so that's what Peter is doing to the believers here, and that's what we ought to, ought to seek to do. And then he begins giving uh, thanks. He says, she who is in Babylon chosen together with you sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. Uh, many believe that uh, the chosen or she who was in Babylon mean, uh, believe that he's talking about the church. Uh, she chosen together with you. Uh, so he's talking about the church, the community uh, of the believers. Um, and so we have, to, we have to begin to really grab again um, the communal church, the, the community of believers, the body of Christ, and fight against uh, this isolation is kind of, kind of Christianity. No, we didn't do life together. Amen. Matter of fact, that's when the Holy Spirit came, right? When they were all together and on one accord. And so that's what the Lord uh, was calling the church to uh, in, its, uh, in the birthing of it. And that's still what the Lord expects. Amen. Would you bow with us as we pray? Father, in the name of Jesus, we, we thank you again uh, for your grace and for your mercy, for your uh, kind gesture uh, to save us, uh, to send your son, uh, that we would be redeemed, reconciled, that we would not be eternally lost. Father, we pray that you would help believers to grab hold of that truth and to stand firm in our faith in you, no matter how difficult the day or how dark the night that we'll stand firm in our faith in you and whatever the cares are whatever the anxieties are help us to cast them on you we thank you that you care for us oh God father we pray that uh, as this pandemic persists as evil days persist that you would help believers to know that we absolutely have a friend in Jesus Father, we pray that you would touch unbelievers, that as time is winding down, God, that you would help, help somebody who's unsaved, who's not yet placed faith in you, come to a saving faith in Jesus. And Father, we pray that you would use us to play a part in it, God, that we would avail ourselves to your purpose, oh God, that we would look for opportunities to be a faithful witness for you. Father, we pray that you would continue to strengthen and keep uh, our families, keep our homes, keep our, our children. Uh, strengthen your body, oh God. Help us to live for you. This we pray in your son Jesus' name. And all who love the Lord say amen. Amen. God bless you. May he keep you is our prayer. Amen.